أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله إلا بالله العلي العظيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المذلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم مجمعين من الأولين والآخرين إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد صلى الله على محمد وعلى محمد Mu'mineen, mu'minat, brothers and sisters in Islam and Iman, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. We've talked about identity, Muslim identity, identity loss. From there, the main question that we left off with is that, okay, this stuff, you know, abstractly sounds fine. We kind of get this idea of how we've disconnected from Allah, we've forgotten about Him. And when we forget about Allah, that leads us to performing things that we shouldn't be performing. Or we don't perform the things that we should be performing, right? So we're now trying to figure out, after discussing last night, what are some of the factors? We just went through a few of them, there's many, but at least some of the major factors that have aided in a negative way and caused us to slowly forget about Allah more and more. The main ones that we talked about was not understanding and remembering and recognizing our origin, which we remember every time someone passes away. Inna lillahi wa inna alayhi raji'oon. We are from Allah. We are sent here on a divine mission, right? That is our perspective. We're not here just to be a statistic. We are all sent with the capacity to be a khalifa on this earth, to be these divine representatives. That is our job, right? Second, we talked about how the way that tarbiyah has been done to us and that we will do to children has affected and moved them away also sometimes, whether done intentionally or sometimes unintentionally, and made us or our children more materialistic, more dunyawi, has, they've created different priorities in their life rather than Allah and the deen and the Ahlul Bayt and the Quran, etc. And then we said also, after all of that, a person's close friend circle, that's going to mess them up too. If the people that we hang around with are ones that are pulling us down to be on their wavelength, if we are not the sort of alphas in that group that can help guide them and make them a little bit better, then we're going to go down with them. All right? So these are some of the factors. Now again, we could have talked about media. It's a very cliche topic, but we, I think we all know how bad social media is right, there, right, you know, right now. Mainstream media. Uh, we could have talked about, we did allude, this, uh, allude to this last night, uh, sometimes the way that even the manaber, the pulpits, are being abused by people who may not and should not be sitting on them. They're spreading misinformation. They're spreading problematic ideas. That can cause confusion. Uh, we could have talked about, you know, gone in depth about Islamic schooling. Some of these things, I think my assumption is, uh, just based on my, you know, little time here with this community and speaking with Sheikh Jafar and some of the, uh, the other, you know, wonderful mu'mineen and mu'minat here, some of these things may not be such a major issue here. So I didn't feel like it was necessary to kind of dive into that. Now, for example, you have multiple Islamic schools here, which I've understood to be very successful. So it doesn't seem like for most of you that should be an issue. But khair, there's more to discuss. This was just a way for us to think about some of the more important ones. And again, if there was anything that we could have left with last night, tarbiyah, tarbiyah, tarbiyah. Islamic parenting, refocusing and making sure that as parents, we teach our children how to do and destroy their egos by us showing them how it's done. We kill our egos, destroy our nafs, and then our, par and then our children will, inshallah, follow suit as well. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Okay. You know, sometimes when, you know, uh, we have these discussions, people are like, you know, Hassan, all this negative stuff, like, you know, problem this, problem that. What about the solutions? Like, okay. But thanks for your patience, like, we, we got to it, we're there now. Okay, we now need to figure out if we've accepted the fact that, you know, identity loss has occurred to some degree, 
Right? We've lost our true Muslim identity, our Husseini identity, our Shia identity. It's gone. It's weak. It's deficient. Okay, Hassan, how do I get it back? Okay, don't worry. I'm here. Papa Bird's going to feed you. Don't worry. I'll take care of you. All right? Now, how are we going to do this? Well, if we're trying to get back that identity, now, the things we talked about last night, hopefully these should be, you know, reactive sort of measures. Maybe even some degrees they can be preventative measures. Right? If I'm a parent, then hearing and remembering about tarbiyah means that, okay, I can now raise my child with the proper identity, right? So I can prevent any sort of identity loss in the future, right? That's one thing. You might say, okay, well, I've already been raised now. I'm out of that stage, right? I'm 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, whatever. So the tarbiyah issue is not there. The friendship circle, maybe that's not an issue. Social media, maybe all these other things, they're not an issue anymore. Regardless of that, well, what do any of us do to get it back, though? Especially at an older age, what can we start doing to get it back? Well, to figure that out, we need to have a better idea of what it actually means to have an identity in the first place, right? right? We kind of toss it out very quickly on the first night. We want to go just a bit more in depth, right? So it's going to get a little bit more philosophical tonight. And you're like, we already did that for the past few nights. What more do you want? Like, it's just a little bit more. Uh, there won't be any DC references tonight, unfortunately, for those who are waiting for that. No Marvel ones either. But I might throw in a Christopher Nolan reference. It might be helpful, inshallah, over here. If you can recite another salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Okay. What actually makes up our identity? The first night we said values. Like, you know, sometimes when we just toss out a bunch of these sort of fancy words, even one syllable, two syllable words, we're like, yeah, of course, identity is your values. But what does that mean? What does that actually look like? Well, let's give examples. How many of you have seen Inception? Okay, not enough where I can use that as an example. How many of you have had a dream before? Okay, still not enough. What are you people doing? I think you're eating too much before you go to sleep, right? Or maybe you're not eating enough, I don't know, right? So, I'm assuming the vast majority know what a dream is, right? Okay, right now, how many of you think that you're dreaming? Okay, none of you. You're like, okay, if this is a dream, this is actually a nightmare. Who, who in their dream is sitting down in front of a lecture, right? This is really, not really what my, what my dreams comprise of. But okay. You think yourself, I think myself to be awake right now. I think I'm awake, so I'm acting as if, right? So if I want to quench my thirst, I'm going to grab this and take a sip. If I want to get down, I'm going to do certain things. If this was a dream, and we knew it was a dream, what do you call that? What's the term for that? Anybody know? When, yeah, Asan, I heard people whisper it. You can shout, it's okay, it's all right. Lucid dream, yeah, there we go, right? So lucid dream is when you are aware that you're dreaming. So what's the first thing that you do? If you are like me, hopefully you're not too much like me, but if you are somewhat like me, when you figure out, oh my God, I'm dreaming, I do the Superman right away. That's the first thing I do. I just start flying in the air, right? Sorry, if there's somebody around that I don't like, maybe, you know, when I give him a gift, right? flying through walls, shooting lasers. I do all that stuff. I do the superhero stuff, right? You do things that, what? You won't normally, you can't do in reality. I'm dreaming, so the rules are not there anymore, right? For those of you who are familiar with the Matrix, I'm probably going to lose even more of you there. If you haven't seen Inception, most of you probably are not the Matrix generation, right? I know some of you are. Actually, I, I need to see this. How many of you have actually seen the Matrix? Oh, whoa. Okay, for the safety and security of all these mu'minin, salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. More of you have seen The Matrix than Inception. That's really interesting. Most of the communities I've been to, it's actually the exact opposite, especially when it's like the younger generation, right? Because Inception, they're like, we don't even know what that is. The Matrix, they're like, oh, the thing that Andrew Tate talks about? I'm like, no, not the thing Andrew Tate is talking about. Please, come on. Okay. Great movies, both of them. Uh, if we ever have time to do a tafsir, then we'll set up a separate workshop for that, and we can go into that more in depth. But here's a little bit right now. All of these ideas are all coming from this idea of the allegory of the cave, those who are familiar with Socrates and Plato and all that stuff, right? This idea of trying to understand the difference between reality and illusion. What is real and what is fake? Again, it's all about this idea of acting as if. Right now, because I think I'm awake, I'm going to act as if. I'm not going to jump off this member and fly. If I do, I'm going to fall flat in my face and you all, half of you are going to try to control your laughter. <laughs> Some of you will try to help me up, maybe, but while you're trying to hold your laughter in, too, I don't know what you're going to do, right? And then the media team is going to be like, okay, now from this timestamp to this timestamp, we need to edit the video to make sure that this doesn't show up online, right? To save my izzat, my dignity. 
But if it's a dream, then we're going to do something else. Meaning, when we have a certain understanding of reality, our behavior is going to change. If we think you're in a dream, if you think that reality around you is fake, you're going to do dream-like stuff. You're going to break the rules because there are less rules there. You can do whatever you want in a dream, right? You can go run around, do whatever you want. In reality, you have to play by the rules. When you jump on the road over here, you have to drive normally. Although, being here for a few days, I see that you people in Toronto don't drive like normal human beings. I don't know what's going on out here. But I understand now why your insurance rates are so high. <laughs> it makes sense. But in a video game, when you know it's fake, yeah, you drive, right? You drive to win. You drive fast. You swerve in and out. You go crazy. You can do that. You can drift and do all that stuff. Hopefully, you don't do that on the actual road. So whenever we see and understand the rules of reality, we act as if. If we know that, hey, the reality that I'm in right now, it's lower or different, then we change our behavior, don't we? OK. Keep that in mind. Let me give you another example to help tie this together. If you can recite another salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Okay. How many of you are vegans? Nobody? Alhamdulillah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, sisters, if you happen to be and I didn't see your hands, but okay. How many of you know somebody that's a vegan? Right? Okay. So vegan somebody who doesn't have any animal-based products and things like that. Vegetarians might have animal-based products, but they won't actually eat the you know, animal meat, right? Okay. I'm sure many of you might be vegetarians. I don't want to ask about that, or at least know somebody. Now imagine if, let's say, I was a vegan. I said, I'm a vegan or I'm a vegetarian. Like, okay. Now, I want to you know, go out. You say, hey, Hassan, let's go out somewhere to eat. I said, okay, fine. Now, I've told you that I'm a vegan or vegetarian or something, right? It's like, okay, let me pick a place. Yeah, so you're probably thinking, I need to find a place that has, I don't know, like salads or something like that, right? Or it has uh, beans, I don't know, something plant-based. That's what you're thinking. So we go out there, we park, and you know, there's a lot of choices around here. And we go there, waiter comes around, taking an order. You, I'm assuming, again, I'm assuming you're mu'mineen, mu'minat of a high caliber, especially with all the, the Matrix viewers over here. So maybe you decide, you know, I'll take the filet mignon, medium rare, with side of asparagus, you know, nice, nice meal, right? So I said, oh, you know what? That sounds good. I'll take that too. Now, what's going to be your reaction? Yeah, exactly. Like, what? You're like, uh, Hassan, didn't you just tell me you're a vegan or a vegetarian? Like, how can you? You know, filet mignon is it's beef. It's from a cow. How are you eating that? I'll be like, no, 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 no. I'm a spiritual vegan. <laughs> Again, you're going to laugh just like that. Like, what do you mean you're a spiritual vegan? Like, Look, I understand the harm that comes to animals, but, you know, I love meat. And, you know, sometimes I eat it and sometimes I don't, but I'm a vegan at heart. You would laugh and say, look, you're not a real vegan then. You're not a vegetarian because you're eating meat. Real vegans, real vegetarians, they don't touch this stuff at all. It's either you are or you're not. That's it. You've, hopefully you're following this train of thought a little bit, right? Acting as if. Now, you and I, what are we saying? La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma sallam wa Muhammad. We shared the narration from the fifth Imam where he said, look, Islam, being a Muslim, is just saying that you believe in a bunch of stuff. What is a mu'min? What is somebody who has iman? They say it, they believe it, and they act on it too. Meaning this whole spiritual Muslim, spiritual religious stuff is out the door. Like, no, we don't have any of those. If you do, that means you're a Muslim. You can be a spiritual Muslim technically, but you can't be a spiritual mu'min in that sort of Western definition. If you're a mu'min, that means you are acting as if. Now, what does that mean to act as if? For a vegan or vegetarian, because they think that, hey, animals feel harm when they're being eaten. They wouldn't want this. They feel pain. So we shouldn't go out and eat them. Again, just I'm giving them as an example. I'm clearly not that. Obviously, I do eat meat, by the way. right? And I don't know if that exists in Islam, not to offend anybody, but I don't think we have this concept of veganism or vegetarianism in Islam. Right? It should be eaten at least once every 40 days if possible. But uh, yeah, just a side point. Because you know nowadays we have all these people who have inserted foreign ideologies into Islam, right? Now there's a lot of, like, this vegan Muslim movement. I don't know how it came. All the Ahlul Bayt ate meat. And, you know, in some narrations, it even talks about some of the favorite meats of the Imams. We have some of these narrations, too. Very, very interesting. But that's, when we do the <laughs> a full-on biography somewhere in the future, I can talk about the food preferences of the Imam, inshallah, right? Another time. So, if I'm saying, Allah, I believe that you created me, you are the master, you are the mawla, I believe that you gave me hidayat, you've given me guidance, you've given me life, you continue my life every single moment. Without you, I can't exist. 
you didn't leave me alone. You sent down a book for me too. You sent down 124,000 prophets. All of those teachings have continued and culminated in this perfect prophet, Insanul Kamil. And you didn't leave us alone there too. You continued it with Masumin after that. 13 of them after the prophet. 13 of them, perfect human beings, all leaving teachings there too. Right? Just reinforcing what you, Rasulullah, have already left behind. And they, these Ahlul Bayt, they have solidified and codified some of these ideas, taught it to their students. Those students taught it to their students, and it's been passed down. We have this system of wilaya, which passed down to the ulama. We have maraja, we have warafa, we have all these things, and we have these teachings in our hands right now too. So we have all this stuff there. A system of reality given to us. And what do we say? Well, this one, not so much. This one, not so much. This one, I don't like so much. We start picking and choosing. And some of these things we don't even practice at all. In a sense, that's why I mentioned the other night. Theoretically, inside of ourselves, you might say, yes, I am a Muslim. I believe in Allah. I believe in the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt and the Quran and the angels and Maraj and all that stuff. When it comes down to practicality, our moral philosophy may be no different than another atheist. The way that we speak to Allah may be no different than a Christian. The way that we think about heaven and hell may be no different than, I don't know, a Jew. The way that we think about money in Islam may be no different than a Scientologist, right? This can get you know, crazy. If I want to throw in another, let's say, religion under the bus, the way that we think about emotions might be just like the Jedi, because the Jedi messed up, right? With the, if you guys know your Star Wars stuff here properly. This was uh, Qui-Gon's... Oh, I'm, I'm going to get into this too much, and then some of you guys are like, there's too much Hollywood stuff going on here. Like, where's the Ahlul Bayt? But let me stop there. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. The point is the same principles flow everywhere. That's the idea. Anyway, Qui-Gon was right. That's, that's my main point. That's what I'm trying to say, right? And Ahsoka to some degree too. She was right. Anyway, okay. So, you and I have followed this system. We say that we believe in it, but when it comes to actions, we fall short. Our identity should be this view, this lens that we're looking at reality with. We're looking outside at the world and saying, this is what I think. Is this place like this or like that? What is real out there? Who, gets, who calls the shots? What should I do when, let's say, I find some money on the floor? Do I just make stuff up as I go along and say, oh, finders keepers? Do I say, no, it goes in a sadaqah box? Or do I say, no, this specific issue, like all other issues, has been identified either in the Quran or subsequently by the Ahlul Bayt. It's been passed down, and my marja has a fatwa for that, and I follow that. I don't just make it up as I go along. Or when it comes to socio-political issues, something, again, regarding abortion, the, again, some, I don't know if I should mention letters or not, because some parents get offended if I mention letters on the member, but you know, these movements that I'm talking about, everybody has their own idea. Some people say, look, you, know, you do you, whatever, freedom for everybody. Others say, no, we have to be very strict. Some say, ally ourselves with this more like right-wing party. Some say, no, we can't ally themselves, ally ourselves with them because let's say they have this certain stance with this country. So everybody's all over the place. It's like, okay. Did you and I get that idea from ourselves? Did it come from my own nafs, my own ego? Or did I try to source that idea from Allah, from the Quran, from the Ahlul Bayt, from my marja, from an alim, from an arif? Where is it coming from? Where is the source from this? All of that is based on how I see reality. My identity, or another way of putting it, as some of the ulama put it, is what is my sort of worldview? Worldview comes from this idea. How do you view the world? Every single one of us, we put on these shades, these lenses, these glasses, and we see the world in a certain way. If you've got no God, then you see the world one way. If you have Allah, and then you add on certain features, then you see the world differently than everybody else. If you have this concept of Allah and the Prophet and the Imams XYZ, then we see the world differently than everybody else does too. Everybody's conception of reality is different. That's why most of us, us versus the outside world, we can't agree on even how to discuss these issues anymore. Right? My body, my choice. Like, that's their slogan. Like, no, this body belongs to Allah. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. This is not us. That, that line is not our line. Freedom of speech, freedom of this. Like, look, that's your stuff because that's how you see reality. Our lens has been given to us and provided by us. So the way that we have to view identity is that, look, this is not mine. It's been provided to me. So what we have to do while we sort of quiet, lower, and destroy the ego is figure out how do I see reality Bila tashbi, through the eyes of Allah. How does Allah want me to see this outside world? And this sharia, right, literally the path, Allah is saying, look, the bare minimum is this. This is how you need to act when you're in reality. The bare minimum. These rules and regulations are the bare minimum if you want to survive as a human being. 
Otherwise, if you start transgressing this, you start disobeying this, you're not playing the game properly at all. Right? Any sport, any game has some basic sets of rules. Right? Even before you start figuring out, you know, uh, technique and how to score the most points, whatever, like, look, you have to follow rules. Don't go out of bounds. You can't travel. Uh, if you're in soccer, you can't grab the ball whenever you want, if you're, unless you're the goalie in the box, whatever it is. Everybody has a set of rules, but, you know, this is my older brother's one of his favorite analogies, which I think is great, is, look, Sharia is telling you, follow the rules first. Beyond that, then we can start telling you how to progress in this game, in the game of life. All that goes back to your identity. Allah's saying, I'm keeping it simple for you. Here's some bare minimum red lines. Stick with that. But when you're ready to go beyond that, then we'll show you how to spiritually evolve and spiritually ascend. Let's go a bit deeper now. If you can recite another salawat on Muhammad wa Muhammad. Worldview is how you see the world. How I see the world, whether I see this as a dream, I see it as reality, but there is no God, whatever it is, that is going to affect how I'm going to act. That will dictate my actions. If I see this world just like a dream in one way, then I'll act as if. That's my real identity. It's a combination of my belief system and how I see this world. That in turn will lead to certain behaviors and actions. And that's why you see such different types of thoughts, behaviors, and actions between so many different types of humans, and even amongst us as Muslims, and even amongst us as Shias, because we're looking at the world differently. The way that you and I might even conceptualize the Ahlul Bayt, the Ahlul Bayt, the Imams themselves, might vary from one person to another. One person might think of the Ahlul Bayt as, you know, very harsh, stern individuals, so that'll bleed into their life, right? They'll act like that too. If somebody else sees the Ahlul Bayt as always just loving and merciful to everybody else, that's going to affect their behavior, or it should affect their behavior one way too, right? If we're reading the Quran and we only see these ayat, which are, you know, Allah has uh, you know, flooded this community, and He's destroyed this, and He's done this, and Allah has punished them, punished them. And if you don't do this, then this is the punishment. That's going to give us one conception of Allah. If we see all these others, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, oh, Allah can forgive this, Allah can forgive this, Sabaqat Rahmatuhu Ghadaba, that His mercy comes before His wrath every single time, that's going to change our perception of reality and of Allah, right? That'll change my behavior too. Because all we are really doing is trying to, in a sense, again, without tashbih here, we're trying to act godly in every single moment too. We're trying to manifest those names of Allah. Whatever conceptualization of God that I have, I'm going to bring that down to this world too. My God is hellfire and brimstone, like Hitler, Third Reich type, then it's going to be a very harsh, strict household. If it's a more open, again, I'm not saying which one is which, but it should be obvious. I think these are two extremes that exist. If it's just love, 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 this sort of hippie Islam that's out there now, progressive and liberal, God will forgive you for anything. You know, if you pray to an idol, God will forgive you for that. Like, you know, where this is coming from, I don't know, but khair. this is out there too. So that household, the way that we raise our kids, the way that we interact with each other, that will also change, right? So this is how identity or worldview translates to the way that we act in our behaviors. All of this summed together is identity. And all of these things, all of this identity stuff can be summed up in the way that we answer these, you know, three simple questions. Three simple questions, and that will give us what our identity is. Let's go through them with the salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Let me give an analogy to, or an, like a thought experiment for us to see if we can figure this out ourselves. Imagine that you wake up all alone in a, a room, all white all around you, right? It's just wall, 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 right? Small enclosed room or like a box. You don't see any windows. You don't see any doors. It's just walls, white walls all around you. What are some of the initial thoughts that you might have? What, some, what are some questions that might come to your mind. So yeah, where did I come from? Meaning, how did, I, how did I get stuck in this box, right? How do I get out of here? And what else? I heard something else too. What's happening? That's something, right? So all these ideas, right? So in our reality, that's what we are sort of asking too. It's not just us as Muslims. Every single human being has thought about this to some degree. Whether they've come up with an answer or not is different, but to some degree, we've all thought about these things. First is, how did we get here? Meaning, where did we come from? Like, what are we doing here as humans? We are created. We're this, right? Okay. Then, we're like, okay, now that we're already here, even if we can't solve that first question, what do we do while we're here? Right? While I'm here right now, what am I supposed to do? 
Do I do whatever I want? Are there a set of rules? Is there a way that I can get out of this box or get out of this life in the best way possible? Like, what do I do? And the third is, okay, well, after this sort of box, or for us, out of, after this life, is there anything else after this? Right, so I guess one of the best things you can say is like somebody drop you in an escape room, right? Like after you clear one room, is there something else beyond that, right? Is there another room you have to solve, right? Something like that. Same things. Now, let's first answer this as followers of the Ahlul Bayt, right? So again, you can give me your cookie cutter Sunday school answers and it'll work here. Where do we come from? How do we get here? Allah, there we go. Yeah, one, one word, that's it. One word is Allah. That's how we got here. We already talked about this. You all know it. Allah, that's how we got here. Simple. Okay. What do we do while we're here? Obey Allah. Very simple, right? Okay, awesome. And what happens after this? Return to Allah, right? It's very, very simple. Everything's revolving all around Allah. But now we've got to get a bit more detailed into this. Say, okay, come from Allah, sure. Now, what do I do while I'm here? Well, somebody says, follow Allah. Well, how am I going to figure that out? Do I, am I going to get divinely inspired? Like a Joan of Arc moment? Like what's going to, what's going to happen here? Right, do I just get ilham and mukashifad? I'm just waiting for divine inspiration. How do we actually get that information? How do we know what God wants? Where does it come from? Who does it come through? Quran and prophets, Ahlul Bayt, etc. Right? So there's individuals who have been sent down. Right? Primarily, the, you know, throughout time, it's been the prophets. They're the ones who said, hey, you know, there's this, I don't say person, entity out there, God, who created you. That's where you came from. This is what he wants from you. Right? And then they were also telling them, hey, afterwards, you know what happens? There's this idea. There's something else that's going to happen after this. This place is not it. There's another one. There's another world. There's another room after this. And that's the one that we're going to be in eternally. Now, I'm sure most of you realize that these three questions, they've been framed a different way for us when we usually go through our sort of Islamic diniyat or lessons in naqaid. These questions and answers. What are they called? Ahsan, there we go. Ahsan, mashallah. It's usul al din These are the fundamentals, the baseline for our religion, for our deen. Where do we come from? It's Tawheed. It's Allah. It's only Allah. That's it. What do we do while we're here? Nubuwa. Allah said, I'm sending down people. Now, we, of course, as Shias, extend that to Imama, right? The system of wilaya, of course, right? It's continuing with Nubuwa. That's what it is. And afterwards, it's Ma'ad, resurrection, or Qiyamah, that we're being accounted for based on what we did over here. We've got the answers, or to some degree, we know how to answer these things. But, like I said, we're not the only ones out there. Everybody has to have an answer for this. So, based on this, based on how we answer these questions, we should be able to act based on that. Based on the fact that Allah's created me, and that He sent down guidance, and that I'm going to be accountable for this afterwards, my behavior should be according to that, if I actually believe in that stuff. Now, if somebody doesn't have that, let's think about a typical atheist, although there's, you know, they're on a spectrum, although I don't like that word anymore, but... You know, there's many different types. A typical atheist, where do we come from? Oh, nothingness, right? Or from some random pool or whatever, I don't know. Some, some quantum unconsciousness or, you know, some whatever it is. Quantum uncertainty, whatever they're talking about nowadays, right? We don't know nothingness, okay? Came from nothingness. What do we do while we're here? Doesn't matter. It's, there's a purposeless life. Nobody can make the rules over here, right? Science can't tell you. Our rational thinking can't tell you, right? Anybody can just make it up, right? If you know what postmodernism is, you make it up as you go along because we don't know. There's no way to define it. It's like, okay, so what happens afterwards? Well, you go back to where you came from, which was nothing. So it came from nothing, do nothing, and go back to nothing. What is their answer? It's nothing, nothing, nothing the whole time. And they're the ones writing papers, giving seminars, writing these huge books, all about what? Nothing, nothing, and nothing. That's, that's I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying it, obviously, but if you boil it down to what's going on there, it's all nothingness. That's what they're claiming. And now when you see, and you know, for those who are into philosophy, this is what Friedrich Nietzsche was saying. He said, when you move past a certain point, literally, na'udhu billah, he said, you've killed God. God is dead. And who now becomes the Superman? Sorry, I said no DC references, but Nietzsche did it, not me. He said, who becomes the Superman then? Each and every one of us. And one mistake that people make when they analyze Nietzsche is they think that he was the one who said, this is the right way. He was just analyzing the world and say, when you kill religion, when you kill God, Nothing is left anymore. There is no truth. There is no reality. Meaning, you've covered your eyes, so when you cover your eyes, there's nothing left. You can say, well, what, what do you see in front of you? You can make it up. You're just hallucinating at this point, whatever you want to see. That's what he's trying to tell society. And some people are so sort of deluded, they've grabbed his teachings, this nihilistic, nihilistic philosophy, and that's what they do now. They do whatever they want. They quote people like this, and they live 
as if they are the Ubermensch, the Superman, and they live their life any way that they want to. Even some Muslims are living their life like this. Right? There's this new trend of this, what we call postmodern Islam, where they say, look, you can't tell me what my God is like. You can't tell me what the Quran says. I have an aql too. I have a fitra too. I have a pure intuition that God has given me. I'll read the Quran and I'll make the conclusions for myself. I'll read the riwayat and I'll figure it out what it says. You know, the, I, I do taqlid to the imam of the time. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> These are the things that we're hearing now too. Right? The same sort of trend is creeped into our own communities as well, unfortunately. Okay, let me pause here. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So all of these questions, hopefully this maybe has solidified the idea of what identity means. It's identifying what these questions are and what the answers are. When you look at those questions, an atheist has tried, everybody has tried, they've given different answers, we're the only ones who have the real and true answers to the quiz. Nobody else does. Only you and I do. Now the question is this, we've got the answers, what are we doing with it? Right? Again, we're trying to reclaim our identity and get it back. Well, here's the problem. Even though we can recite the answers, as many of you have done. Is simply reciting the answers enough, or is there something else that we have missed? Let me share with you a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He's reported to have said, La yasduqu imanu abdin, that the iman of an abd, the deep faith of a servant, a slave of Allah, won't be, be sadiq, won't have sid, sidaqa, won't be real, won't be true, unless what? Up until what? Hatta yakunu bima fi yadillah subhanahu awthaqa minhu bima fi yadi. A person's iman won't be realized, it won't be true, it won't be at its proper level, until and unless what is in Allah's hands, they trust that more than what's in their own hands. If I'm holding something in my hands, and I think I know what this is, and Allah says, no, that's not what's in your hands. It's something else. Do I believe Allah? Do I believe myself? If I'm holding, whatever, a diamond, I say, look, this is how much worth and value this has. And Allah says, no, everything in the dunya is worthless and valueless. I'm like, well, Allah, that's your opinion, but this is my opinion. Right? Is this how we approach life? Think about our own sort of contemporary examples. Allah makes a lot of claims in the Quran, through the Ahlul Bayt, saying that, look, have tawakkul, I'll take care of everything. Right? Don't worry about it in terms of having children, getting married. Don't worry about your risk. I'm the one who's providing a risk. I'm ar razaq Wallahu khayrul raziqeen. Every Friday, right? It's being recited. Wallahu khayrul raziqeen. Allah provides. In the Quran, Allah saying, get married, have children. I'll take care of you. But what happens? Some, we say, no, 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 no. Don't get married yet. Don't get married young. Wait a little bit. Get a job. But don't just get any job. You have to get, you know, a a high salary paying job. Well, don't just get the job and have you know high paying salary. Have some savings. Well, okay, not just savings, but you need to get a house first. If you want to marry my daughter, you need to have a lot to show for it. Meaning that Allah's claiming, don't worry about the risk. I'm taking care of it. Get married and it'll increase. We are stepping in as parents sometimes, or even those who are trying to get married and say, look, Allah, that's your criteria. That's great. I've got my own criteria. These are some other qualities that I'm looking for in a spouse. These are some other muqaddamat and prerequisites that I have in my mind before I let my children get married or before I get married. Allah has laid it out. There's many riwayat on this too. I'm sure they've had you know, spouse selection or marriage courses that have happened in you know, the GTA area. Okay? I'm sure it's happened. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. But sometimes what happens? Allah mentions these things. The Ahlul Bayt mentions something. We say, look, deep down, what are we saying? I don't trust you. I trust myself. I trust my eyes. I trust my ears. I trust what I understand. Allah, you say that you are in charge of my risk, I get it. But right now, times are tough, times are rough. Maybe I got to lie and cheat my taxes a little bit. Or maybe when I'm selling something, I have to lie about that. Or maybe I have to you know, take a little bit extra, whatever it is. We are subverting Allah's system, right? We've answered those three questions. We said Allah, you know, Tawheed, Nabuwa, or Ma'ad, Qiyamah, all this stuff. Quran, Ahlul Bayt, we said all that. When it comes down to actions, the identity falls apart. Why? A part of it says, Allah, really, I don't trust what you've offered. Whatever system that you are saying that you've offered, sorry, not for me. I'll believe in it. I can recite it. I can recite these ayat of the Quran for you. I can, I memorize these, you know, uh, riwayat from the Ahlul Bayt. I'll cry for them. I'll come to the jashin and I'll say not ahead. I'll do all this stuff. But when you want me to act 
based on the reality that they've told me to act on, if you are, if they are telling me, if you're telling me, Allah, Ahlul Bayt, Quran, if you're telling me this place is a, a dream and an illusion, sorry, I think it's real. So I'm going to have to act as if. That's what's happened to our identity. Those three questions, and I missed this hadith, but I think it's important to share. Those three questions, they're not just coming out of nowhere. These have even been addressed by Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wasalam. In one hadith, he's reported to have said, Rahimallahu imra'an alama min ain fi ain wa ila ain. May Allah have mercy, which literally means that Allah's mercy will come to you if what? You have ilm, you have knowledge of what? Min ain, where'd you come from? Fi ain, where are you right now? Wa ila ain, where are you going? Same three questions we said, right? He says, if you can figure out your real identity, you answer those things, then Allah's rahmat's upon you. You'll be good to go. But again, he's not just saying that, answer the questions like it's a quiz, but really have answers for these. So much so that it changes your belief system and it changes your actions. Another hadith is reported to have said, okay, because we have to figure out, these other hadith are saying that we have to have this trust level in Islam and Allah too. So there's a gap there too. Another hadith, he says, afdalul iman, husnul iqan. If you want that afdal, that high level iman and belief, you need to have husnul iqan. يعني حسن meaning good or beautiful or excellent and إيقان يعني يقين So those three questions, we can write down the answers we can probably pass the Sunday school exam you can answer it in front of me I can share it from you on the member right now but how many of us actually really have يقين in all those things? When you go and tell somebody and somebody says, you know, what do you believe? and I say, well, I believe in Tawheed meaning that there is only one Allah I say, okay, do you really have that belief system? So much so that that's how you act in reality? Well, maybe not so much. Well, why not? Well, I don't know, I've got some doubts in my mind. I'm not sure. Maybe we don't voice them, but maybe somewhere deep down it's there. Especially, as we mentioned last night, as one of the factors in the outside world. When everybody else around us, the huge, vast majority of people, don't believe in this stuff. What is their reality? Everybody else says, hey, this is real. We're saying, no, this world is a dream. It's an illusion. Darul ghurur. This is fake. The next life is what's real. This is fake. This is an illusion. We build up for the next one. They're like, no, you guys, you guys are messed up. What's wrong with you? This is the only place that you have. Only one life to live. This is it. There is no God. Why are you believing in some sky god, some sky fairy, messed up stuff from the barbaric, you know, Stone Age, 1400 years ago, thousands of years ago? There is no rationality. There's no scientific proof. What are you doing? Our own colleagues, our own classmates, our own friends, sometimes even family members will be saying this stuff to us. Sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly. They might be, let's say, verbal, like Muslim, through zaban, right, through lisan, through speaking. But deep down, again, when it comes to, let's say, namaz time, they make some offhanded comment. Like, abayar, like namaz time again, like, ah, what's the point of this, right? They, they make these sort of jokes and these weird comments. Where is it coming from? It's coming from a place where they have doubt in all this. You know, most of the questions, and, you know, this may come as a shocker. A lot of times what you see in, like, a Q&A, or even the questions that you and I might have, Right? We were joking about it last night. Oh, why is Maghrib three rakats? Why, why is Qasr only for these kind of namazes that are four rakats? Why, uh, why are dogs nudges? Why, why, why? Most of those questions, if you see, have to do with what? Furu' al-deen, right? Most of the questions we have have to do with the way we act. If we've paid attention to what we've been saying the past few nights, is that really the problem, you think? Where is the problem going back to? If you have a problem in the furu', where is it stemming back from? It's probably from the usul, right? The person who's questioning and lazy and lackadaisical and maybe doesn't want to get up for Fajr and offer that Salah, or even to a large extent, maybe Namaz al-Shab Salatul layl is maybe somewhere deep down, they're like, is this stuff even real in the first place? Like, is Islam even true? Is God even real? Even if God is real, is He even just in the first place? Like, does He even care what I do? Or again, because of these new creeping ideologies that have come in, and I've seen so-called Shia speakers, I don't want to use the word scholar for them, They've tweeted out, or whatever the term is, like, like I said, I don't know anymore. There that, oh, Allah is so merciful. He's so amazing. This deen is so great that why would he be involved in little details of your life, like praying and fasting? Who cares about these things? These are, these are the things that people, speakers out there are tweeting. People who claim to be, you know, Shia scholars. That, oh, Allah doesn't care about these details. And people are enamored by these kind of points, right? They're like, oh my God, this is, yeah, when you have love and mercy, like Allah, He's the most merciful, so yeah, why would He care about little details? Like, 
Think about it for five more seconds. Just five more seconds. Anybody here? Doctors, right? If somebody's, let's say, heart rate goes up one or two, does that matter, right? If the degrees over here, the temperature over here goes up one or two degrees, does that matter, up and down? You feel it. If somebody's, uh, I don't want to say blood alcohol level, <laughs> but let's say their um, uh, what am I blood sugar, right? That goes up. These details matter. A doctor who cares and says, look, I'm paying attention to your labs, your charts, your results. These things worry me. For the parents here, if the temperature of your newborn infant or your child goes up half a degree or even a degree, we freak out, don't we? As we should. Every little detail matters. Let me, ask, let me say it another way. Every one of us, I'm sure most of us, if we have the proper, let's say, system in the household set up, out of our parents, we know there's the most amount of love and mercy and compassion that we share is going to be for our mothers, hands down, right? No matter what they've done, the mothers deserve more than what we can offer them. We all know that. Now, there might be one day, on one hand, your mothers, and if your mothers are alive, may Allah give them a long life. And for those of us whose mothers have passed away, may Allah give them a maqam and a darajah with the Ahlul Bayt. Imagine now, your mom, she says, hey, get me a glass of water. Simple request. Sometimes we get lazy there too, but whatever, maybe you do it. Now, imagine if your mother says, can you get me not just a glass of water, but I want a specific type of mug. I want the mug heated to exactly this temperature, and the water that goes in that glass, I want it to be at this temperature. Now, what, do you, what would a real loving child do in that situation? Would they say, Ugh, mom, why? Like, what's the point? Who cares about this? Like, why, why does this even matter? Or would you say that, no, this is my mother. This is the one who was the wasila for me to even exist in the first place. You say, that's what you want. I'm going to go and do it. No questions asked. That's what, my mom, that's what my mother wants. That's what my mom wants. I'm going to go and do it. Details matter. And for somebody who loves us, and if you love them, then you're going to care about those details too. And that's why you see some people who are very pedantic about the sharia. Sometimes it's waswas, other times it's out of love, right? When we're like half a degree or whatever off of the qibla, you see some people are like, no, 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 like get me five other apps, like get me a real compass, like show me the stars, I need to get this exact, right? Sometimes we're like, you know, why are you so obsessed? Sometimes it's shaitan, sometimes it is, not all the time. But a lot of times it's coming from a good place. People who are obsessed with some of the sharia, it's like, well, this is Allah. This is my mahboob, this is somebody that I'm, I'm you know, really in love with. More than anybody else, I want to make sure I get these things right because he, more than anybody else, deserves it. When they ask Amir al Mu'minin, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu was salam, you know, and I'm paraphrasing various types of riwayat here, why this type of worship? Why all this? Is it because, you know, you fear for hell? No. Is it because you want Jannah, the businessman? No. What is this? He's like, it's because this is what Allah deserves. This is, I'm in love with Allah. This is what my Mahboob deserves. This is what Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Ghafoor, al ghafar Like, what else should I do when somebody has given me life and given me all this hidayat, put all this stuff in my life? What else would I do by, besides saying, Sami'na wa ata'na, I hear and I obey. We hear, we obey. That's what, we, that's what Allah deserves. And deserves more than that, but we can't do anything else. We can say, Alhamdulillah, thank you Allah, Subhanallah, Allah, you're amazing. But even that, Allah's saying, yeah, that's cool that you did that. Who, who gave you the ability to do that? I did. So can you even do hamd for the fact that you do alhamdulillah? You can't. It's impossible to do there. I tell you to say shukran lillah. When you say shukr, who is the one who rewards you for that saying shukr to me? I reward you for that. You can never, never get, there's no payback to God. But there, that's, that's the relationship we need to have. So our reality needs to be built around this sort of system. The system that the Ahlul Bayt have had there, right? So we're getting, you know, we're running out of time here. Let me share one more hadith. Again, this one from Imam uh, Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam. <laughs> when we're trying to figure out, okay, this identity loss, all the problems, getting it back, we need to figure out, again, part of the inception of all of this stuff. And yeah, we mentioned some of the factors last night, but I think the Imam succinctly here, in some other books, it's mentioned that he's narrating this from Rasulullah. Regardless, you know, we said they're nur wahid anyway, they're all one light, doesn't matter. This famous hadith says, رَأْسُ كُلَّ خَطِيَّةِ حُبُّ الدُّنْيَا The inception, not the movie, the beginning, the genesis of every single mistake and sin that a person makes is what? حُبُّ الدُّنْيَا Not the dunya, the dunya is fine, the dunya is neutral. What is the problem? Us being attracted and enamored and enslaved to it. When we fall in love with this place, when we think that this is real more than the next place, then we're done. When we treat the little room that we're stuck in, 
when we treat a hotel as a real room, when we treat a rental car as our own property, when we treat an escape room like it's our own thing, when we treat a dream as if it's actually reality, that's when our behavior changes, right? We have been enslaved and we're stuck in this place. That's why I gave that Superman analogy, right? When Clark thinks of himself as a human, that messes everything up. That's why he cannot become Superman. He has to let go of that and ascend higher. You and I need to do the same thing. When we let go of this bodily, physical, dunyawi identity, that's when we can ascend higher. When we recognize the reality of this place and how Allah is saying, look, I'm not trying to just annoy you guys. I'm not trying to give you a bunch of rules to, to bother you or just to say, oh, I am Allah, I'm powerful. Out of nowhere, I'm just going to make this stuff. He's saying, these are the rules for reality. You're trying to play this game of life. These are the rules you need to play by if you actually want to win. You want to do well. You want to ascend. You want to be insan al kamil. You want to be that perfect person in this game. This is how you do it. And even there, he says, look, there's a, a few rules you've got to follow. It's actually not that bad. It's not much. But if you want to be the best of the best, then there's other things you have to start implying. Then you have to go a bit more beyond that. Then there's certain other principles you need to start following. So this sort of identity crisis and loss, the way that we need to start getting back to it is by figuring out how do I get towards that yaqeen where I can toss this dunya aside. Where I can go back and say, yes, I, when I look out at the world, all I see is tawheed. I see exactly the things that Allah wants me to see. And we see that that is where we're, what we're lacking in our nafs. The way back to it is through the way that Allah has taught us. The way Allah is saying, you have to come through me if you want to see reality properly. Don't make up stuff as you go along in life and say, well, I'm taking a little bit over here, a little bit over here, putting some weird mix, some hybrid idea of Islam together. Allah is saying, no, I have given you this deen perfectly. As they famously say, Islam in Nab, right? This perfect, unfiltered Islam, non-watered down Islam. You practice this, then nothing's going to harm you, nothing's going to change you. Everything's going to work out in your life. So our identity comes back to all of these ideas. And again, as we mentioned in the first night, and I'll repeat it because it's worth repeating. This islah that Imam Hussein is doing is trying to get them back to this, back to your identity. So look, you guys already said that you believe in Allah, you believe in the Prophet, that you believe that there's a day of judgment. Why did you just abandon that all of a sudden? So much so that you have a sword at my neck right now. And that's why on the battlefield in Ashura, he's like, don't you know my grandfather? Don't you know my mother? Like, did you not see the ayat in the Quran about us? Like, what happened to you? What's going on? And he mentions many reasons there. I mean, most of these we've kind of gone over. But he's telling them, like, you, know, you guys are lost right now. You have all the Zahiri stuff, the apparent stuff. You're reading Quran, you're praying, you're doing all that. But deep down, you don't have yaqeen in what's out here. You're not practicing what you should be practicing. Why? Because you don't really have that itminan, that yaqeen. You're not certain about what God has said. If you were really certain, there's no way you could take a sword to the son of Zahra. It's impossible. There's no way you could do that. If you are in love with this place, then you'll do anything. Look at Umar ibn Sa'ad. He is very clear. He says, I know Hussein. I know his maqam. I know his value. I know his mother. I know his father. I know his grandfather. I know all of this fadail. It's like, but what does he say? What can I do? I'm in love with the dunya. I want to be, I want power. I want control. I want to be a governor. And that messes him up. And that's what happens to us too. His identity gets destroyed because of this stuff. He falls in love with this place, with control over here. When Allah's saying, you follow my rules, I'll make you a king, an imam, not just in this world, but in the next world too. You get whatever you want there. This stuff is, this stuff is, is done, right? كُلُّ شَيْءٍ halik إِلَّا وَجْهَ Everything here is going to be destroyed. This is all imperfect. Don't you want perfection? Allah's saying, I'll give you perfection. You can't get it over here. You're never going to get it over here. This place is meant to be destroyed. We say it's fleeting. It's, it's, it's an illusion. It's not real. But shaitan plays on that fact. He says, no, 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 this is real. This is, this is what you get. You've got to taste the dunya and then you'll see. And then he just builds up on that love and enamorant that we have. Khair. I'm sorry, forgive me, I'm going over time. Where we want to now take this discussion is where the Ahlul Bayt have tried to point us back every single time. Is what gives life back to our nafs, right? The eye of the Quran said, don't forget about Allah. You forget about Allah, we forget our nafs, our identity. So how do we get back to our real identity? How do we get our true nafs, our fitra back? Again, this will be the final hadith we end with tonight. Once again, from Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wassalam. <laughs> He's reported to have said, At-Tawheed hayatun nafs. You want that lifeblood for your nafs back? Imam Ali is saying, Tawheed will give you life back to your nafs. That'll bring you back to life. Your nafs has died. You're acting like an animal now. You're in love with the dunya. Back to Tawheed. Go back to the main thing 
which distinguishes us from everybody else, even other so, quote-unquote monotheists, which inshallah we'll attempt to discuss if Allah provides tawfiq tomorrow night, why our tawheed is different than everybody else's, and specifically, why the word monotheism is the worst translation possible for tawheed, but we'll discuss that tomorrow. And we'll figure that out. Once we get a better understanding of tawheed, then nubuwa falls into place. Or before that, adal falls into place. Nubuwa falls into place. Imama, wilaya falls into place. Ma'ad, yawm al qiyamah, ghayba, everything else becomes easy. Once your tawheed is solid, everything else is fine. Once you have that yaqeen in Allah, then you're like, okay, that's fine. I don't care if dogs are nudges or pigs are nudges. I don't care if I can't eat this. I don't care if these chips become haram or this candy I can't eat. None of that matters to me anymore. I don't care if the rest of the world is practicing this or doing that. None of that affects me. Why? Because I have a trajectory. I have my maqsad, my destination in life. It's Allah. I know where I came from, what to do, and where I'm going. The rest of the world can think that they're in reality. I know that this place is a dream. I know that Imam Ali has said, Anas niyamun, that they're asleep, that when they die, they're going to wake up. But I'm going to follow the narration, the teaching of Rasulullah when he says, Mutu qabla anta mutu. Die, right? A spiritual death before you die physically. We can wake ourselves up. And Tawheed is one of those great, the probably greatest thing that we can use, according to the Ahlul Bayt, that can wake up our nafs. And when we get yaqeen, true yaqeen in what Tawheed means, now again, to do that, nobody really gets that. But inshallah, from you know, our last, uh, at least lecture part, tomorrow night, that's what we will attempt to do, is to solidify and re-strengthen our true identity by looking at Tawheed from perhaps maybe an angle that we may not have heard of before. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. One more salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You know, there's some times where we hear just a name and then our heart breaks. Right? You hear Ali al Asghar and immediately Mu'mineen, Azadaran, their heart breaks. You hear Sakina for the true Azadaran, heartbreak. They talk about Zainab, heartbreak. Hussein, heartbreak. Sajjad. Right? These things immediately our mind jumps to something very specific and we start to grieve right away. And most of you, as true grievers and worshippers of, uh, of Allah and the deen and followers of the Ahlul Bayt, when you hear these simple stories, these simple lines, then our hearts just collapse right away. Our heart gets destroyed right away. And that's why, why anybody who sits on this pulpit, when they mention that one famous hadith right away, just a few lines and right away our mind runs someplace and then we can't come back from there. When somebody comes and asks Imam Sajjad, you know, what was so difficult for you? What was the most difficult for you? Three words, the same one repeated three times, and our heart is gone. What, Imam, Ya Imam, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, what, what was the most difficult for you? We asked about Hussein, but what about you? Asham, Asham, Asham. Not the difficulty in Karbala, not Kufa, but Sham, Bazar Sham, Darbar Yazim. This is what's difficult for the Ahlul Bayt. And I want to share it from the perspective of somebody else. Normally we hear it from the Ahlul Bayt. We hear it from those supporters of Yazid. I want to share another story with you for tonight. They say that there is one person. He was an actual companion of Rasulullah. He happened to be traveling and during his travels, he was passing through Sham. As he was passing through, he heard all of this commotion. He said, I, it, it, he's narrating himself. He said it sounded like there was some Eid, that there was a parade going on. So he didn't know where it was coming from. He saw a group of people sitting down. He went to them. He said, no, what's going on? You know, do you people, Ahl Sham, is there some Eid, some holiday that I don't know about that you people follow? Because there's obviously something happening here that I don't know about. And these people ask him, oh, are you a kafir? Like, are you, are you Muslim or not? And this, he's a sahaba, he gets offended. He says, I was one of the foremost of ashab of Rasulullah. How can you say that? He's like, well, then don't you know what's going on over here? He's like, aren't you, aren't you surprised that the skies are not raining blood right now? Aren't you surprised that the skies haven't gone dark right now? He says, I'm confused. I don't know why. You're, what are you saying? Why are you saying this? He says, don't you know right now that they're celebrating the head of Hussein going to the bazaar right now? 
Don't you know that they are celebrating the ahl haram of Rasulullah being paraded around in the streets? He said, go and see for yourself if you think yourself you're a sahaba. And when he hears this, his heart breaks. He says, which gate? Where do I go? He hears this. He's crying and running, trying to figure out what's happening. He runs and when he comes through this gate, he sees people beating drums, singing songs. He sees music played. People are singing there. There's flags and colors everywhere. And then he sees that there are people throwing garbage from the top. When they asked Imam Sajjad, they said, why was Kufa so much different than Sham? Why was Sham so much worse? He says, in Kufa, when we were going through Kufa, the people gave us water to drink. They gave us clothing, they gave us food. When we came to Sham, they threw garbage on top of our heads. They threw boiling water on top of our heads. One historian says that the boiling water, when it hit the Imam's Amama, the turban that was on his head, because of the heat in Karbala, they say that his Amama almost caught fire, but he was unable to take it off because his hands were still tied to his neck. He wasn't able to take it off. So this Sahaba, he sees all this, he, does, he sees the head of Imam Hussein, his heart breaks, he sees the nur from Imam Sajjad, but then he sees women, he looks to the front, he sees young girls who are sitting in front, he says, what is going on over here? He runs to this young girl, who he then realizes, who are you young girl, what's happening over here? He says, don't you know, Ana bintul Hussein, I am the daughter of Hussein. <laughs> My grandfather is Ali, my grandfather is Rasulullah. And he, his heart breaks. He says, I was with your grandfather, I'm one of his close friends. Tell me, do you have a hajat? Do you have a desire? Let me do something for you, please. And she says, you seem like a nice man. Ya Sheikh, do one thing for me. He says, as we've been traveling all the way from Karbala, from Karbala to Kufa, and now from Kufa to Sham, as we've been paraded through these streets, the whole time, the head of my Baba has been in front of me like this. And now because the head of my Baba is there, all of us women, all of us children, our hijabs have been taken away. So these strange non-mahram men have been staring at us. We've had to look at the heads of our, our own fathers and our own brothers and our own uncles, please can you tell them move the heads somewhere else so that they at least don't look at us anymore and they look these people look at the heads of our family members. So this person goes and tries to pay off the soldiers and say go forward somewhere else and move the heads away from these women. Then we hear from Umm Kulthum, they say that as they came closer and closer to the doors, the gates of Yazid, عليه, as they got closer and closer there, they wanted to do this zillat, they wanted to lower the status of the Ahlul Bayt in everybody's eyes. So they didn't allow them to come inside right away. They said we made them wait outside for hours and hours and hours in this heat while they were still tied in chains, while there was no comfort given to them at all. And they said the worst thing of Umm Kulthum narrates herself, he says the worst part about it, is on that door while we are waiting from the gate they took the head of Hussein they hung it from that door so this was the only thing that we could see and she says Ya Jadda Ya Rasulullah this is the head of your Habib Hussein hanging down like this Ya Jadda Ya Rasulullah every time that we want to do, do the Aza we want to cry for seeing this head of Hussein well, whenever we want to cry and mourn for this someone comes and whips us from the back someone comes and hits us on the head of their spirit Ala la'anatullah ala qawmi dhalameen wa sayya'alamu alladheena dhalamu ayyamun qalbin yanqalibun Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un ridhan bi qadaihi wa tasliman li amri Matameh Hussain